Hello. Um, thank you for coming on a Sunday afternoon. And um, it's, um, it's a pleasure to be here with Nancy and, and Phil. And um, the first question, which, you know, to, to both of you, you can you know, take it in whichever way you like, is about homecoming. Um, so the, the title of this session is What are the truth? The truth and lies in relation to homecoming. So what is the truth and what are the lies that are told in relation to homecoming? <laughs> <laughs> and you can take that in whatever way you want. You're on. You want to go? One of the things is that home doesn't, doesn't look quite the same when, um, when you get there. I, since we're talking about the Greek word, this is of course, Odysseus comes home and, and doesn't recognize where he is and doesn't, um, until he meets his dog, right? Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, one of the things for me about particularly the current wars is a lot of the people that I knew joined with a sense of idealism, right? And you come home from a war that feels vitally important to you um, because you've, because you know at a very sort of visceral level that the stakes are life and death. And for me, one of the very strange things about coming home was just the degree of disconnect. Um, you know, what, what America looked like when I came back. I, uh, in a strange way, or what parts of America looked like because I was there for 13 months, so I had two weeks of leave, and I went straight to New York. Mm -hmm. um, and I remember having a, talking to a journalist, a photographer, who said, no one should ever go straight to New York from a war zone. It's too weird. Mm -hmm. um, and that was you know, exactly how I felt, right? But when I came back, at the end of my tour, I came back to Camp Lejeune, North Carolina, where that is a community that actually did feel like it was at war. Um, and so, you know, because everybody in Jacksonville is either in the Marine Corps or involved right. in an industry, they know people. Uh, and so renegotiating what, what your relationship is uh, to the America that you left behind is, I think, is, is always something uh, mm -hmm. that every veteran has to work out. And then in today's military, you know, you leave the military and yet, because these wars just keep going on, <clears throat> the people that you know keep going over. Um, if you're a veteran, you know, I live in Brooklyn. Every once in a while someone tells me that I'm the first veteran of either Iraq or Afghanistan that they've met, mm -hmm. right? Um, and, yet, and yet I know people who are going over. I know people who every once in a while you find out something very bad has happened to them. And so what, what that makes you think about your country and also your, your relationship to your own citizenship and your responsibilities as a citizen is something that I think that everybody needs to figure out, particularly now as, as we see what's happened in Iraq. Can we, I mean, just before we, before we go any further, who, who in this room has in, uh, engaged in military service? We have one, two, three, four. Okay. Which is more than I thought. So that's, uh, that's interesting. What is, it, what is it, I mean, in, in terms of... Um, because this comes up in the in the book redeployment and in interviews, the, the coming home and then being met with um, either hostility or apathy and indifference. I mean, does that? Or does or, that, or very well-meaning pity. Well-meaning pity as well. Um, yeah. Or you know a desire to. <clears throat> um, pathologize a veteran. I, you know, I, I, um, I can't tell you how many times I've been diagnosed with PTSD by people who uh, are not medical professionals. I don't have PTSD. I know I have plenty of friends mm -hmm. who've, you know, experienced some degree of post-traumatic stress. Um, you know, I was told by one guy in a bar that uh, Iraq veterans have, are, they're all going to snap in 10 years. And since you've been back for three, you've got seven left. Um, right. He said it kindly, like, you know, like, this is information I should <laughs> know. Right. So seven years left. <laughs> I better make the seven years count. That's right. Um, <clears throat> you know. I think, I think that's a really good point. I'm going to just tag on. Um, 
I think some of what we go through here, thank you for your service, is a kind of reaction to mm -hmm. Vietnam when mm -hmm. you didn't get thank you for your service. And it is a bit of pity sometimes, or it's a guilty and, um, reticence, or I don't know what else to say. It's, it's a polite phrase. Mm -hmm. And it, it's too little. It doesn't do very much often to the, mm -hmm. the um, veterans I teach at Georgetown and elsewhere. And it, um, it does bring up lots of emotions that never get talked about, like a certain amount of resentment a half percent served and everyone else didn't. Um, there was no war tax. Um, folks at Brooklyn don't know many who served. Um, so that's uh, this disconnect that you spoke of. Mm -hmm. um, the, the homecoming is also for people here because they don't quite know how to bring people home. And as you say, many aren't coming home in the sense that where they were, Mosul, Talifar, are exploding again. Mm -hmm. Places they thought they had left in reasonably good shape, mm -hmm. connections they had with the elders or you know, um, partnerships just sort of fizzle. And that sense of real instability raises all those kinds of questions. Not that necessarily provoke PTS, post-traumatic stress, but lots of moral ambiguity. Absolutely. And, you know, and that's something that's not just a, a, a soldier, sailor, Marine's problem, air, air wingman's problem. That's all of our problems. Like, Give me more a sense of the, what, what kind of moral ambiguity in, in particular. Well, you go to war. Mm -hmm. uh, we philosophers like to talk about just war theory, especially mm -hmm. if you went to a Jesuit <laughs> high school, as oh, I yeah. know you did, and I teach at one. But um, it has a long Jesuit, uh, long uh, Catholic tradition mm -hmm. from Aquinas and, and Augustine on. But is the cause just that you're mm -hmm. fighting for? Is the conduct just? Is it being waged justly by um, secretaries of, of defense, secretaries of state, you know, people that put forth the money and appropriate the funds so, you, so you're safe and have the right supplies and material? And when you come home, just use post bellum. So those were use ad bellum, use in bello, going to war, in war, and after war. And what we're talking about right now is homecoming. Gnosis is about post-war. It isn't really post-war because, as you say, you have friends that are still going over, and it mm -hmm. just will, we're just upping the troops again. So that moral, those moral questions, sort of justice written in your soul. Why did I do it? Should I have done it? Um, did I do the best I could ever have done? Why did I come home and another person didn't? Mm -hmm. You know, sometimes it have to do with transgressions. Sometimes there really aren't transgressions, but they feel like them, where you hold yourself strictly liable, almost, right. you know, but you're not really culpable. Yeah. Or is society doing enough to take care of me, my buddies, make us all, you know, get decent loans, get into school, apply to school if you could. Right. Um, so this is that's a huge yeah. issue. That's all about morality. That's justice, morality. Mm -hmm. But let's, let's stay with the morality question because there's a question which is, I mean, you're, you talk about this in the forthcoming book, after all, and um, I'd like to also hear what Phil's got to say about this, which is the question of moral injury, right? And um, really how moral injury is experienced by service men, but also service women, and whether it's experienced differently by service men and service women. There's a tendency, perhaps, to um, obviously masculinize the, the soldier figure. And, um, and then, in relationship to that sense of moral injury, what then happens? Um, what forms of repair um, are possible? And that's also something you've, you've thought about. So. Um, how about that question of moral injury in relationship to service men and service women? Well, I'm, I'm, the word injury sometimes sounds too strong, but I'm just thinking about moral pain, you know, anguish that isn't that you're a loose cannon and you're going to explode in seven years. But, you know, there's uh, war zones are entrenched 
saturated death places and you're an agent or you're a victim or you're a bystander or you're a collaborator or you have all these hazy partnerships in current warfare. Um, and you're in population centric areas. You're right there with everyone as you know. So you can't but ha have all these issues uh, that you don't, that I can't process even as a professional. You, we, we'd be hard pressed to figure out Absolutely, yeah. all the theory behind it. And so it just sort of hangs and it gets, it leaks out or occasionally is felt and God, you know, I'm supposed to be never, le never leave a buddy behind, but I, but I did. Um, I came home and there was someone fallen or um, that's not what a Marine does. You know, really harsh perfectionist kind of ethic, but I did do that, and so am I less a Marine than I thought I would have been? Um, or I came home integral, and the guy next to me is missing his whole bottom. Mm -hmm. Or women. I got a raw deal, you know? Uh, I felt less safe inside the wire than outside the wire. Now something's wrong there. Mm -hmm. I can't go to the porta potty without feeling like I'm gonna be stalked. Someone steals my bras and panty. These are people I talk to when I'm doing my wash and they're circulating rumors about me, you know, or I'm, right. I'm a deer being preyed at, at in, the, in the chow hall, so I can't even wear shampoo because it smells too good. So that's, all that's, am I being treated well? Did I do something wrong? They've got sexual urges, but I shouldn't be their prey. Those are all morally ambiguous kinds of things that hurt. And so to say you're, you're, you know, you're hyper vigilant, you can't sleep at night, you have flashbacks, that doesn't even begin to get it. a few questions of doubt. At least that's the, those are the people that I talk to talk to me about. Is that your experience? Yeah, and also, you know, the, <clears throat> if, you, if you view those as a symptom, then it's something to be solved, but they're actually serious moral questions that these people are working through. You know, what, what ought I have done? The stakes were very real. Um, and you can have, you know, circumstances. I know in your book you talk about a, a, a marine or soldier who shot a child who's nevertheless, you know, uh, aiming a weapon at him. And what do you make of that morally? Uh, and so it can be things that you did and then also broadly what you were a part of. So I met a marine in an event recently <clears throat> and he, you know, he stood up and he said, um, a marine veteran of Iraq, that used to be something I was extremely proud of. And uh, you know, if you'd, if you'd asked me to make a resume of my life, not a resume for a job, but just like who I am, all the, he said all the biggest bullet points would have been, you know, Marine, combat veteran, you know, led troops, led a squad in Iraq. Mm -hmm. And then he said, but now I'm looking at what's happening there, and I'm starting to wonder what I was a part of. Right. And was, I, was I a part of an evil thing? And if mm -hmm. I was, can I be proud of it? Because if I can't be proud of it, I don't know, who, I don't know what my identity is, I don't know who I am anymore. And, you know, it's, it's a serious question for him because, you know, the, the just war series, like guess walls are, it's, you know, there's, is it war just and is the conduct just? But if you join, particularly with a sense of idealism, you did join because you wanted to, to, to do something good in the world. Which in your case, was the, that was the case, right? That was your Yes, case. very yeah. much so. Mm -hmm. um, and then, trying to figure out what your piece of what's going on overseas, like what that is now, what's my piece as, as, as someone who joined the military, yeah. what's my piece as a, as a citizen, right? Um, well, let me ask you, well, how is it then? I mean, you know, given the, the kind of moral and political ambiguity that we have gone through in the, or people have gone through in, in, in Iraq, say in Afghanistan and Syria, I mean, how does, how, how do you, how do you, I mean, the, the idealism that you had is in the, the Guardian interview that you did, that you, you went into, you joined up, and uh, you served, you came back, and then various things have happened that we all know about. How does that, for you, morally kind of square up, make sense, or just does it? Well, it, I mean, I, I don't feel the way that that Marine felt. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I am proud of my service. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it will be, you know, one of the honors of my life to have been a Marine officer. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I mean, even early on, so I was, I was commissioned as a second lieutenant in 2005. 
<clears throat> At which point, you know, a lot of things were clear, right? Uh, and, you know, you, you talk in your book about moral luck. Um, and in one, in one way, that'll just because this is a time when, when the um, American public was starting to turn against the war. Previously, I mean, the war reached approval ratings the high 70s, uh, which we forget now. 2005 was when that started to happen. WMDs, you know, we knew that. So it, for, me, for me, it was less a question of should we have gone in, which people were still, would debate with me at the time as if that made a difference to my decision. Um, but more, so what, what do I do now? You know, um, what ought we do? Um, and I didn't control policy. I was deeply frustrated that Donald Rumsfeld was still Secretary of Defense and a variety of other things. Yeah. Um, but at the same time, I do feel a lot of grief and rage about the things that are going on right now. And, and it's, it's, you know, very viscerally felt. I, I was talking to a, um, uh, a veteran who's in the army, and she was talking about how when there was recent massacre of the Yazidi people, she was just weeping in her office. And to the people around her who weren't unconcerned, it was, well, this is kind of what happens in Iraq. But, but for her, it was something, Rise. You, you know, a tremendously powerful response because she knew those people and didn't know what ought be done but mm -hmm. very much felt like we had collectively some sort of obligation in that regard. Yeah. Can, I, can I just I mean, dig into that a bit deeper? It's really interesting and also because one of Nancy's books is um, subtitled What Ancient Philosophy Can Teach Us About the Military Mind. And um, the argument that you present in a number of different forms, there are versions of this in The Stone and elsewhere, is that there is a kind of um, disconnection between um, a very stoical sense of virtue, of doing the right thing, you know, and um, a very austere kind of morality that is this common in the military, and a disconnection between that and the feelings of guilt, shame, responsibility for uh, a wrong, the sense of being wronged and so forth. So there is this kind of, in, in terms of how we talk about these things, think about these, and how this takes place in the military, there's this kind of disconnection between a, a stoical ethic of virtue and doing your duty and doing the best thing, and then these overwhelming feelings of guilt, rage, yeah. shame, and all the rest. I think Would you lay, lay some of that out? Because it's happily. really interesting. Um, so the... the Military is a stoic place. When I started teaching in the Naval Academy, it, that was their philosophy with a big S or little s. It didn't matter. Mm -hmm. um, suck it up and, and truck on. And so reading about the real stoics, the Roman and Greek stoics, was eye-opening to them. But that meant what they resonated in part with the, was the idea, you know, it's, it's exaggerated, but it, you don't show your emotions much. You, you, you carry on. And uh, you got to, because you got a mission. And you do the best you can, you do more than the best you can, and then you live with the consequences. And some of the questions you write are just too big for you to, it's not your policy grade, as people used to say. You know, I'm just not, my, not my pay grade. That's not my problem. But the flip side of, of subjecting yourself to the winds and, you know, and minimizing what you can control, which mm -hmm. is the stoic stance, and then you just tough it out, is that you, you do feel a lot. The fact that you can't control what war you go to easily and that we should, we should have much more public debate than we do means that you narrow your responsibility to the guys that are in your unit, men and women in your unit, to bringing them home, to taking care of them like a parent. And well, for the virtue then gets is shared in the Share, like, platoon. yeah, you know, yeah. you're 23, 24 year old, at least the enlisted Marines I've talked to, and you know, they protect like a, a young parent protects, even if those guys are 20 years older than them. They're their guys, they're women. And to be, it's, that's the place where there isn't a moral vacuum, where they can kind of have some control. Right. And when they, and you know, that's when they say, well, I don't know if the war is just or not, but I know it, I know what my war is to bring you home. Mm -hmm. And when you can't do that, 
because you can't call in an airstrike or because counterinsurgency doesn't let that or what, whatever the because is, that's really, you feel like the, the small area of your control just got eroded. And when that gets eroded, what can you do? You feel enormous guilt. Um, it may not track real culpability because it's a matter of luck. You out things outside your control, but it's like a, kind of like a tort, you, strict liability. You t and that's very military. And mm -hmm. to not be able to process those emotions because a you're persons of action often. You don't, you know, you're not in a debating club to sit around and talk about your feelings often. Mm -hmm. And you got to move on and carry on. And to come home and not know how to piece together that or moral ambiguity, like I was supposed to take care of them and I was going to bring them home, and they were my baby brothers one of my Marines that I write about, Lelo Paniagua, he calls them my baby birds. I mean, he was a kid on the streets in LA who really took care of members of the gang. When he couldn't take care of his Marines in the way he would take care of right. people in his gang. It, it was devastating. And that is hard to process. So those are right. all the feelings that are the other side of the stoic coin. That right. You don't know right. where to put, you don't know how to Square it. You're not supposed to feel anything. You're supposed to just compartmentalize, compartmentalize, compartmentalize. And yet, you're flooded with reminders of you're not as good as you thought you were going to be. You got losses. You're grieving. You're finding yourself crying. It doesn't have to be post-traumatic stress, but it can be just a lot of r residue that's unsolved and comes out in a lot of emotions. Does that ring true? to you, Phil, and the, the, the people that you write about in the book and the um, people you serve with in terms of that disconnection? That Yeah, I mean, that's certainly a huge part of military culture, right? Um, and then, I th you know, I think it's interesting to see the way in which the discussion has, has shifted, I think, over time because... Um, you know, now we're at a stage where, you know, there's um, Medal of Honor recipients and, f you know, four tour sergeant majors who are like, okay, yeah, I, I had post-traumatic stress and let's talk about it. And I think that sort of, you know, there's that stoic ideal that the institution likes to, to put forward and that also I think a lot of young, young guys joining the military, young men and women want to live up to. And then there's the reality of you know, in, in a volunteer military doing four or five, however many deployments, and then just the toll that that takes and the need for, for some sort of um, way for people to communicate it, communicate it uh, about it. I mean, you can't work these issues out in, in, in your own head. And you can't, I should just urge, it's not, you use that great word, you know, you gotta depathologize some of this or not pathologize it. Right. It's not pathology to ask a question like, oh, is that rational or irrational guilt? You know, I can't stop feeling badly about, you know, the fact that I let the guy get out of the MRAP and have a, sh a shit, and then he's blown up the next second. I mean, that's a pretty traumatic moment. And to not know, and it, it, maybe you'll figure out some of it by talking to really um, good therapists, but maybe some of it is stuff that we have to hear in a classroom. I mean, it, I don't know better places sometimes for some when you got the right environment of students that can really um, be good listeners. They've come right. along a long way for 13 weeks with you, and mm -hmm. you've just come home. It's two years later after you've come home from Iraq or Afghanistan, and they've read all the theory and they're reading novels and your kind of work and they also want to talk to you. That's a good place to work out some of these issues. Maybe could, that could be a segue into the, I mean, I want to talk about war, war stories. War stories. And um, because there's a story in redeployment called War Stories and it's an interesting scene for us here in Brooklyn because it's, um, two veterans um, who are talking to two women. One is an attractive Brooklynite, Sarah, um, who's putting on a play about the war, right? So we have that situation of here's the, you know, one of you people, you know, you go and talk to Phil about the truth. And, you want to, and um, 
And then there's this moment in the story. There's two, two things I want to focus on. And I'd like just to, you, you know, how this strikes you, Phil. Um, there's this, this is right towards the end of the story where the character, um, the protagonist, says, want to teach people about war. I say, tossing the cigarette butt right down to starts burning my fingers, starts shooting motherfuckers, set bombs in the streets, get some retarded kids to walk into crowds and blow themselves up, snipe the NYPD. I don't want to teach people anything, she says. Or maybe have them fix potholes for seven months. That'd teach them shit. That's the title for your play, Fixing Potholes with Wilson and Jenks. Then people will come by the fucking thousands. And, um, and it ends with this, you know, this is not the subject of a, of a, for a play. So it's this very kind of macabre, dark humor in there. And the, the other thing I want to pick out is stories in relationship to um, memory, mm -hmm. right? Because, you know, the stories we tell are based on memories and memories can be deceptive. We tell ourselves all sorts of lies, right? That's usually our internal narrative. And there's this moment earlier on in the same story, in War Stories, where um, the protagonist says, I don't trust my memories. I don't trust my memories. I trust the vehicle, burnt and twisted and torn. Like Jenks, no stories. Things, bodies. People lie, memories lie. It's very strong. Um, what do you do with that? You know, the, um, the question of the war story, how one writes a story about war, given these kind of caveats that you're, and the way you're framing it, how does, maybe you could talk about that. Sure, so, well, the, the, the two characters, one is severely burnt, um, you know, and he has a, a particular narrative about his, his homecoming um, and what that meant. Uh, and it's actually a very positive, you know, at the end of the day, uplifting sort of story of survival. And the other character, who's physically quite fine, is, is um, deeply cynical and embittered. Uh, and, and neither of them, so they're both, they were both, they were engineers. They, they did, um, you know, they weren't kicking in doors. They were never in combat. They spent their time, you know, filling in potholes so people couldn't put IEDs in the road, doing route clearance, and then one day, one of the guys got blown up. Um, and, I mean, this is one of those things that we know, like, uh, you know, you ask, like, a cop if there's a, there's a, you know, a murder, a robbery, or whatever, there are 15 witnesses, you get 15 different stories, right? And then over time, we, we settle into a narrative about what we've seen. We become more and more sure of it the, the more that we tell each other that story. Um, it doesn't mean that there's not some truth to be, no. you know, to be, yeah. to, to be accessed, but that we need to be highly aware of, of, of what we're doing. And one of the things that happens is there's the stories that each of those characters want to believe about their war experience, what it meant, what they're able to, to effectively testify to, mm -hmm. and then also the stories about veterans that exist in the civilian sphere, the ways in which that character is going to interpret. I, always I already talked about you know, the, the you know, kind of weird notions of PTSD that have less seemingly to do with you know, the, um, a clinical diagnosis than, than how it functions as a meme in the culture. Um, there's also the notions of, you know, veterans as these kind of heroic types and, and, and their experience of fixing potholes is not anybody's idea of what you right. do when you go right. overseas and go to war. That my war was seven months fixing potholes. Mm -hmm. All I have to show for it is um, a wariness of IEDs and a friend who's been horribly mangled. And then how do you, how do you communicate that in a meaningful way? Um, not just so that you'll get a better purchase on what it meant for you because you're, you know, if you're inside an experience, it's hard for you to get perspective on it. But how do you engage with a, with a civilian audience? Um, does, does that mean that you should, as it were, in a sense, disappoint the civilian audience in terms of the story that's told? There's this moment also in the book, which I want to quote, because it's really, it's really funny. But um, it's on page 47, where it says, there's a joke Marines tell each other. A liberal pussy journalist is trying to get the touchy-feely side of war 
And he asked the Marine sniper, what's it like to kill a man? What do you feel when you pull the trigger? The Marine looks at him and says one word, recoil. Right? Now, that, that one word recoil is obviously the recoil of the trigger, but it's a recoil which can be a moral recoil. It's a recoil, but it then raises the question that what are non-veterans looking for in stories of war? What kind of recoil are they, as it were, want to be attracted to watching The Hurt Locker or whatever it might be? And um, why do we get off so much on stories of war? Isn't there something really worrying about that? I, I met a veteran who said to me, you know, he said, um, the only stories anybody ever wants to hear is the worst shit that ever happened to me. Then, you know, like, they don't want to hear about the, the guys that I love, that I was with, or even like shit what the biggest barracks rat I ever saw was, right? Um, and, you know, there, there's a way in which, in order for, for a real dialogue to happen, right, I mean, both sides need to kind of be interested in for, forgiving each other for the mistakes and gaps in communication, gaps of knowledge, and then just sort of push forward um, and not be invested in, you know, talking to somebody as a type and what can I get out of that. And veterans do that to civilians as well. Um, On that subject, I thought um, you had a piece in one of the papers that was just great about, um, I, don't, I don't even know how to talk to you about what you've been through. You know, someone says to you, or says to a friend of yours, mm -hmm. and this person, either herself, who says that, or, or, um, or her friend, you know, was a victim of sexual trauma. Um, and the reply is, yeah, you, 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 you get it, you know what it's about. I mean, that's the, that's the severe side, but the other side of what you're talking about is, look, um, a lot of military engagement right now is mixed engagement. It's like policing, it's used to be called peacekeeping in the, right. in the Bos uh, Bosnia, Kosovo days. Mm -hmm. um, and it's, it's like a myth of incommunicable trauma. There's this yeah, kind of, it's all sorts of yeah. things. It's sitting down for hours upon hours, um, politicking with the elders, learning to like chai, figuring out, you know, what the cost of a, 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 a cattle, you know, sheep or whatever, or goat, and, and how much reparation you have to make when you take someone's animal, and that's their livestock in Afghanistan. It's all sorts of things, and so, I, I mean, I actually think war journalism has been amazing these past 12, 13 years in getting us all somewhat online to not expect that there's gonna be ticker tape parades for people coming home who are decorated with every imaginable honor. And so I think that helps, but I still think there's this, um, I mean, my kid said this to me, and I thought it was really telling. Um, I was visiting my son, um, he was at Stanford, and I was talking to um, uh, an army veteran who was really, really severely damaged, uh, lost his bottom half, Dan Berzinski, who has been covered a lot in the media. And um, he gets around on a Segway, and he learned how to walk with two canes. He's pretty amazing, and so I asked um, my son and some of his friends, do you know what Dan's story is? Have you talked to him? He's on campus, and not many people are willing to ask what happens, because it's, I mean, in his case, it wasn't in, you know, a big moment, but it didn't have to be. He doesn't think of it as, as a huge, huge deal. So there's this chasm. How do I approach the questions? When they're visible, how do I approach it? When they're invisible, how do we talk about war together? Talk about police keeping, repairing yep. potholes, seeing IEDs, uh, reparations, it, whatever it is. It's just all of us are in it together. It's right. not, and, this, this is a great quote. This is, this, is, this is you. This is a great quote. I want to quote you. This, 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 this is you on PBS. And it sort of captures what you're saying. They say, soldiers, soldiers carry all the moral ways of war, and we carry very little. Soldiers carry all the moral ways of war, we carry very little. And we need to share that moral burden by realizing that they are our surrogates. So it becomes a kind of shifting of weight, in a sense, right? There's, so that, you know, to relate that to the, the, the joke, the recoil joke. Recoil. There's a bit in Karl Marlantis, a Vietnam veteran, he wrote a book called What It's Like to Go to War. And there's a bit in there where he says, you know, ask the 20 year old combat veteran what it feels like to kill a man. And his probable angry answer, if he's being honest, is doesn't feel like a fucking thing. 
But if you ask that same veteran 20 years later, 30 years later, um, he's going to give you a very different answer. And it won't just be about what he experienced or who he is. It's also going to be about the community that he has around him and um, you know, how that community enables him or doesn't enable him to talk about those experiences and process them. That's right. And you know, the more civilian engagements, I mean, there are contractors, there's civilians too, but there are also, we, we put forward, civilians become soldiers and soldiers come home to become civilians. And it it's, doesn't seem very fluid when you have a professional military, but it is fluid, or it's got to be more fluid. And even if the numbers are small, um, for all persons, and at, you know, at the highest level, institutional, uh, in terms of protecting mortgages, non-predatory mortgages, GI bills, housing, um, figuring out how to apply to universities if you want to get there, TRICARE that's adequate and isn't at the level of Medicaid at certain points. So real institutional courts, court marshals um, and the like, but also really one-on-one, -on -one, um, breaking down etiquette barriers about how you talk about things that have been in the past viewed as taboo. I mean, the history of taboo is kind of interesting, right? My, I'm a World War II kid, and you just didn't talk about that stuff at home. My father came home from, from Britain, actually from Scotland, and um, you know we had scratchy army blankets around the house. He was a medic. Um, you could never get people to talk about the war. It was very could, hard. Yes, and right. so, but that's not my generation. That's not your generation, really. They also had a lot more of them, you know. You read, you read Sam Hines, uh, World War II vet, talking about you know, all the vets swarming his college campus and how they were like, we're not joining a fraternity. No, no guy who went overseas, it, like, you know, went on the beach at Iwo is going to let himself be paddled by some kid from Boise who hasn't done anything. Um, <laughs> see this huge community, right? Um, I, you know, I, I knew a... a veteran who said, you know, my experience as a student veteran felt like the lack of an experience. I wish I could have just been a student. Um, you know, but he, then, he, but, but the, he, he was, was surrounded by the, He was surrounded by 18 yeah. year olds who, you know, mm -hmm. and that was it. But that, that, that's, that begins to say something very interesting about war then, doesn't it? Which is, um, it's not quite an argument for conscription, I'm not saying that, but let's just look in a kind of broader view. Um, you know, there wouldn't have been a Labour government, there wouldn't have been a welfare state, there wouldn't have been something vaguely resembling socialism in Britain in this post-war period had it not been for the Second World War, returning veterans and the suffering that people went through in the Second World War. That kind of population shift led to a direct policy shift in health and education. That's one example. But I want to go further back to the, um, our, uh, to the Greeks because um, Nostos, homecoming, um, we have we have two stories. You know, Homer tells us two stories. Actually, Aristotle says that there's another. There's a burlesque epic called Margites, which was lost, perhaps fortunately. All we have of Homer are these two books, um, Iliad and Odyssey. One of which is a story of war. One of which is a story of love and homecoming. But they're both stories of war. They both take place in the aftermath of the Trojan War, and then. You know, the entirety of, of Greek tragedy is not entirely, but overwhelmingly concerned with the Trojan War. And, um, and it's about combat veterans, and it was performed by combat veterans. Aeschylus fought at the Battle of Marathon. Sophocles was a general. The rape. So everybody in the audience of a Greek tragedy would have either been directly involved in military service or would have been indirectly involved in military service. And we could, we could, we could enrich in that description in, in different ways. But theater, this invention of theater, this Athenian invention of theater, is, is directly a theater of war. Right? And a theater where war is being uh, reflected upon uh, and, and, and thought through, and the grief and the rage in relationship to war has been, been reflected on. The effects on women involved in the war, the Trojan women, Hecuba women, 
uh, Home, Clytemonestra, and we could go on. Yeah, and the comedies too. Now, um, now, there was a uh, a society that produced art, produced theatre, a society that was constantly at war, but with a very different view of war than our view of war, because it seems to me that what is what's not peculiar, but what's distinctive about, say, Greek tragedy is that it's a war story without a John Wayne figure. Right? There's no, as it were, good guy that's going to sort it out. In a world that's gone bad, there's no good guy that rides into town and starts to shoot things up and has, you know, delivers justice. In those Greek stories, the hero is the problem. Right? The hero is really the problem. And that, I think, comes out of a much more intimate experience of war than we have. And maybe if we had a more intimate experience of war, we'd have a very, very different view of what a hero is. That's really interesting. You know, the, the Greek, um, the, the, the nub of a Greek tra uh, tragedy is the hamartia, which means the missing the mark. Yeah. And hamartia is sometimes, you know, when it gets to Shakespeare, it starts to look like your, your mistake, your error. But often in Greek, it's some kind of luck or fate push things, push the arrow toward the wrong target, and so it was bad moral luck. Um, and so that happens to Ajax, who's supposed to get um, Achilles' shield, but instead it goes to the great speech of fire, Odysseus, which is weird. Um, and so Ajax, and I think the only Greek tragedy, commits suicide right. on stage, you know, impaled right there in front of you. And that had to be an amazing moment for a Greek audience who were living in 70 years of a century of constant war, mm -hmm. one deployment after another. Um, and so it is no surprise that Ajax becomes a, a, a theater, literally the group called Theater of War, puts it on in front of military audiences with enormous resonance because suicide is such an issue right now or has been in these deployments since 07, 08 with peaks and suicide. But mm -hmm. also, I'm thinking Philoctetes, another amazing Sophoclean play. Yes. He's abandoned on the island of Lemnos um, and because he has some smelly wound, this fetid wound, mm -hmm. and that, that um, because of a snake bite at, um, at, 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 uh, at, a, at a temple, and they just want to abandon him. He's, he screams, he cries, he's, he's no good, it, it, he's become a cost. And so in a military where you cut down the cost in order to get your end, he's, he's expendable. But they need him for his bow, lo, lo and behold, at the end of the day. He has Heracles' bow. That's right. And they have to come back to get him. To finish the war. To finish the war, you know? And he's not going to give it up easily, except in this amazing moment, he, Philoctetes, a lie, or Odysseus sends out a little kid named Neoptolemus, young warrior it means, Neo, young Neoptolemy, Ptolemy, war, fighter. And he goes out and he, uh, he does what a good interrogator does. He builds rapport in order to ensnare, in order to exploit. And he gets, um, he gets uh, Philoctetes to give up the bow. But I think there's actual real trust that develops. I don't think it's just... It's just manipulated. I think these guys actually come to like and trust each other at the end of the day. And that's a story of hope. I've always read Philoctetes as, God, you know, this is such the worst of Odysseus, like the really worst of this trickster. And, and this young warrior, Neoptolemus, does his deed. And then at the end of the day, I actually think Philoctetes has a homecoming. You know, he, has a, he goes back to his home. But Heracles appears, right? Yeah, there is a deus ex machina. Yeah. <laughs> and says, true. take the sword back. <laughs> okay. That's true. But, but yeah. But but there's a lot of good stuff that goes on. No, but Phil Philoctetes clings to his wound, right? He's got this wound, this bad luck. And it stinks. It, it stinks. stinks. And um, at a certain point, there's this dialogue, which is, sort of relates to what we're talking about, where... He said, we are clinging to your wound. Too much, you know? He's you been, are not your wound. He's been there 10 years, you know? Yeah. He's been alone for 10 years with an arrow. Check, you know, there's only, his only food has been the occasional bird that flies overhead. But, but it, is, it's a, it, is a very, it is about homecoming. And, you know, the Greeks, though, brought, they brought their soldiers, sailors, 
plebes, you know, home to an amphitheater. It was a ritual. There were large gatherings. These were public, public rituals. And that's yeah. in part what some say we don't really have the same, you know. I okay, mm -hmm. good. That, that's very interesting. You, you agree with me, this would be, what, would we, what should we do then? <laughs> I mean, no, not, not in that sense of what should, but what, what would be, what would be, I mean, it's true, Greek theatre, 15 to 18,000 people in the theatre of Dionysus in Athens, in a population of maybe a couple of hundred thousand, right? A significant portion of the population. I guess we have movies, you know, but the, the, our addiction to heroism always seems to be kind of troubling. Well... It's, it's a, we're, we're never gonna have that, right? I mean, we have an all volunteer military. I see no, I, need, I see no sign that that's gonna go away uh, or even that that would be advisable. Um, you know. Uh, they write books. But that's uh, quite little, I mean, that's, that is what I did. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that that, that that conversation about what the service means needs to be made more complex. You know, there's, there's a great bit, there's a, actually a philosopher, Jay Glenn Gray, wrote a book called The Warriors, which is a very interesting book. He served in World War II. And about, I think, 10 or 15 years after World War II, he started reading his notebooks. Uh, and then he just kind of penned some reflections on them. And at one point he mentions how the further you got away from the front line, the more bloodthirsty uh, people seem to be, and that guys right. would get letters from their girlfriends telling them to kill a bunch of Germans for me, um, you know, and that they would be kind of horrified by that, I, you know, and this goes on today, right? I was, I taught middle school very briefly, and when they found out that I was an Iraq vet, like, all these hands went into the air, and they were like, did you kill anyone? Um, and they were so disappointed when I said no, you know, as a staff officer, I was but, um, and it's maybe to be expected from a fifth grader, but I, I've been asked that question by tons of people. Um, right. You know, and I, I was talking to one veteran, he said that's the most obscene question that anybody could ask. Right. Because, and he goes, it's not, it's not the question so much as, as the fact that when it's asked, it's usually being asked because there's no appreciation for the moral weight behind the question. Right, right. Well put. Well put. There's a... The Green Light Bookstore is at the back of the room. You can buy works by Phil and Nancy. And uh, thank you very much for coming on this Sunday afternoon. But join me in thanking Nancy and Phil. Thank you. Thank you.